Hello and welcome to the first of two programmes on car maintenance. All cars need regular servicing and a certain amount of repair. But because of the rising costs of garage maintenance, it often pays to do some of the repairs yourself. So in the very first programme, we'll be looking at the engine and its related systems. And then in the second of the two programmes, we'll be looking at the systems throughout the whole of the rest of the car. But as well as showing you how to carry out the work, we'll also be showing you how each of those systems works. And to help you to refer back to the video, a number will appear in the top left-hand corner of your screen. That number will change every two minutes, and it'll relate to the figure that is printed on the menu at the back of the cassette cover. But just before we begin, a word of warning. Working on a car can be dangerous. Do be careful of any moving parts. Never wear a tie or any loose-fitting clothes. And if you need to look underneath the car, make sure that the vehicle is properly supported. Although design and layout varies from model to model, all cars have the same basic components. There are six main systems mounted either on the car's body or on the chassis. First of all, of course, there's the engine and its associated systems. Then there is the transmission, which feeds power from the engine through to the road wheels. There's the braking system, the suspension, the steering system, and finally, there's the electrical system, which powers the lighting and heating and other ancillary circuits. But first, let's look inside the engine. An internal combustion engine converts fuel into mechanical energy by mixing it with air and igniting the mixture inside an enclosed cylinder. Each cylinder, or bore, contains a movable piston which is joined by a connecting rod to a crankshaft mounted horizontally underneath. As the fuel mixture ignites, the resulting explosion forces the piston to move downwards on its power stroke. This vertical movement is converted into rotation of the crankshaft, which in turn transmits power to the road wheels through the clutch, gearbox and rear axle. In order to allow gases in and out of the cylinders, a camshaft controls an inlet and exhaust valve at the top of each cylinder. This is either gear-driven or driven by a belt or chain, running round a pulley at the front end of the crankshaft. The initial turning power needed to start the engine is provided by an electrical starter motor. This engages with a toothed ring fitted to the edge of a disc or flywheel, which is bolted to the end of the crankshaft. Once it's turning, the flywheel is heavy enough to smooth out the power impulse from each piston, so that it produces an even rotation of the crankshaft. Most modern petrol-driven car engines operate on a four-stroke cycle, with each piston making four movements to complete one cycle. With the inlet valve open, the piston moves down onto its induction stroke, drawing the fuel mixture into the cylinder. The inlet valve then closes, and the piston moves up again to compress the mixture. When it reaches the top, the sparking plug ignites the mixture and causes an explosion, forcing the piston down again. This is the power or ignition stroke which rotates the crankshaft. Finally, the exhaust valve opens, and another upward stroke forces the burnt gases out of the cylinder. The exhaust valve then closes, and the sequence begins again. The cycles are arranged so that each cylinder is on a different stroke at any one time, providing the crankshaft with a continuous rotational force. The engine can be broken down into two main parts both of which contain water and oil passages for cooling and lubrication. The largest is the cylinder block. This houses the cylinders or bores in which the pistons move up and down. The crankshaft is mounted in the main bearings at the base of the block. Each piston rod is joined to the shaft by a big end bearing, which is offset from the axis of rotation. At the other end of the rod, a small end bearing rotates around a gudgeon pin driven into the piston. The other main part is the cylinder head. This houses the combustion chambers where the fuel mixture is burnt. Each chamber has openings or ports for the inlet and exhaust valves 
which are held in place by the rocker assembly mounted on top of the head. This consists of a series of lever arms known as the rocker arms. In an overhead valve engine, the rocker arms pivot on a shaft running along the centre of the head. These are lifted by the push rods, which are raised and lowered by the camshaft mounted inside the cylinder block. As one end of the arm lifts, the other end presses on the valve stem and opens the valve. When the push rod falls again, the arm pivots in the opposite direction and a compressed spring closes the valve. An alternative to this is the overhead cam arrangement, where the camshaft is mounted on top of the head and pushes directly onto the rocker arms, removing the need for push rods. Another variation is the direct overhead cam system, which has no rocker arms. In this case, the cam lobes push directly onto the valve stems. In all of these systems, a hardened steel tappet rests on the cam lobe and as the camshaft rotates, the tappet pushes against the valve stem. A number of other components are externally mounted to the engine. The generator, starter motor, water pump, distributor, and in some cases, a mechanical fuel pump. They're all bolted to the cylinder block. While two castings, known as the inlet and exhaust manifolds, are bolted to the cylinder head. These channel the fuel mixture and exhaust gases in and out of the cylinders. The ratio of petrol to air used for the mixture is controlled by the carburetor, which is mounted on the inlet manifold. Let's see what happens when you turn the ignition key. The car battery sends electrical power to turn the starter motor. A starter pinion on the motor engages in a geared ring on the edge of the flywheel, causing it to turn as well. The spinning flywheel rotates the crankshaft, which in turn pushes the pistons up and down inside the cylinders. The fuel pump sucks petrol out of the tank and forces it into the carburetor, where it's mixed with the air drawn in through the air filter. From the carburetor, the inlet stroke of one of those pistons sucks the mixture into the cylinder through its inlet valve, which has been opened by the camshaft. Low voltage from the ignition switch passes into the coil, where it's converted into high voltage and sent to the distributor. The distributor is driven by the camshaft and sends high voltage along the insulated high-tension leads to each spark plug in turn. An electrical spark jumps across a gap at the end of the plug to ignite the mixture. The resulting explosion forces the piston down onto its power stroke. As we've seen, this happens in a pre-arranged sequence, causing the crankshaft to continue rotating. At this point, the starter motor disengages from the flywheel and the engine is now running. Constant electrical power is produced by a generator, which in modern cars is usually an alternator. This is driven by a belt running around a pulley at the end of the crankshaft. From here, electricity is fed to the main fuse box where it's distributed to the lighting, heating and auxiliary circuits. The electrical system of most cars is now wired negative earth. In other words, the negative side of the battery is connected to earth via the car chassis, whereas all the live connections are made to the positive side. Now the battery is the car's only electrical power source, so you should look after it carefully. Some batteries are sealed for life, so they don't need any topping up. But if your battery is not one of those sealed units, then you must check the electrolyte level regularly. With a translucent battery, you can see whether the level is correct from outside. It should be up to the mark on the casing. Otherwise, remove the cell cover and look inside. The fluid level needs to be just above the top of the plates. Always top up with distilled water. Never use tap water. Check that the vent holes in the cover are clear before replacing it. Check that the battery mountings are secure and that the terminals are clean and tight. Disconnect them from time to time and clean them with a wire brush. 
smear anti-seize compound onto the posts before reconnecting. Check the battery voltage with a test meter to make sure that it's producing 12 to 13 volts. If you don't have a meter, use a hydrometer to check the specific gravity of the electrolyte. Most of these have coloured panels to indicate the state of the battery. If the hydrometer shows half charge or less, the battery needs charging. Make sure that the charger's output is set to the right voltage, normally 12 volts. Connect the crocodile clips the right way round and remove the cell cover. Plug the charger into the mains and switch on, and you'll need to leave it for several hours if the battery is flat. When the meter indicates a full charge, switch off at the mains and remove the crocodile clips. Be careful not to short out the terminals and keep naked flames away at all times. When the engine is running, the battery can only be kept fully charged if the generator is driven continuously by the fan belt. Check that the tension on the belt is correct by pressing it midway between the two most widely spaced pulleys. About half an inch of movement usually gives the correct tension. If adjustment is necessary, loosen the alternator clamping bolt just enough so that the unit can be levered to increase or decrease the tension. To inspect the condition of the belt, remove it by sliding the alternator across until you can slip the belt out of the pulley wheel. If there are any cracks or cuts, you should fit a replacement. Slip the new belt over the pulleys and lever the alternator outwards until the tension is correct and then re-tighten the clamping bolt. If the ignition warning light stays on during normal driving, this means that either the belt is loose or the alternator is faulty. It's usually quicker and cheaper to fit a reconditioned unit which you can buy on a service exchange basis. With the battery disconnected, remove the old unit by taking out the adjustment bolt and swinging the body in towards the engine block. Remove all electrical connections and lift off the drive belt. Then remove the pivot bolt and lift the alternator away from the engine. Refit the new unit in the reverse order and apply a little locking compound to the adjustment nut to prevent it from coming loose. Current to the starter motor is controlled by an electromagnetic switch called the solenoid. Most new cars are fitted with a pre-engaged starter motor with the solenoid mounted on top. In this case, the solenoid also operates a lever to engage the starter pinion with the ring gear on the flywheel. In some older cars, the solenoid and starter motor are two separate units. This kind of motor is called an inertia starter motor. As the solenoid switches the motor on, a pinion gear is flung backwards along a threaded shaft to engage the ring gear. If the starter motor refuses to work, check that all electrical connections are sound. Connect a test lamp between the solenoid ignition switch wire and a suitable earth point. Turn the ignition switch to the start position. If the lamp lights, then the switch is working properly and the fault lies in either the solenoid or the starter motor itself. To test a separate inertia solenoid, press the rubber-covered push button and if the starter turns, the solenoid is faulty. If there's no push button, short out the terminals with a screwdriver. Again, if the starter turns, the unit is faulty. This second method can also be used to test the solenoid on a pre-engaged starter. Separate solenoids can normally be replaced without having to change the starter motor itself. Modern starter motors are very strong and reliable and are unlikely to need dismantling until they're completely worn out. Once again, even if a fault does occur earlier, it's easier to fit a new or exchange unit. Start by disconnecting the battery earth lead. Then make a note of their positions and disconnect the solenoid and starter electrical leads. Remove the motor retaining bolts and withdraw the unit from the clutch housing. 
refit the replacement unit in the reverse order and use locking compound to secure the fixings. Finally, make sure that all electrical connections are firmly in place. The ignition coil boosts the low voltage supplied by the battery to the high voltage necessary to provide a spark across the spark plugs. It consists of two coils, the primary and secondary windings, which enclose a soft iron core. Current flowing through the primary winding generates a magnetic field. If the current is interrupted, the field collapses, causing a high voltage pulse to be produced by the secondary winding. When the starter motor is used, it draws such a large amount of power that the voltage across the battery can drop too low to operate the coil. To overcome this, some cars are fitted with a ballast resistor between the ignition switch and the coil. As we've already seen, the rotating camshaft gear drives a small shaft in the centre of the distributor. A cam section of the shaft has the same number of lobes as there are cylinders. These open and close the contact breaker points at a precise moment in each piston cycle. To prevent arcing across the points, a condenser is fitted between them and the coil's primary winding. As the points open, the circuit is interrupted, causing high voltage pulses from the secondary winding to travel along an HT lead to the distributor cap. These pulses pass through the central electrode in the cap to a rotor arm mounted on top of the shaft. As the arm spins, the current passes along it to a number of electrodes fitted around the inside of the cap. These are connected to the appropriate spark plugs by a set of HT plug leads. Each plug sparks just before the piston reaches the top of its compression stroke. As the engine speed rises, the spark must occur earlier in the piston cycle. This is achieved by either a system of centrifugal weights inside the distributor or a vacuum connection from the engine. Both systems cause the contact breaker mounting plate to be moved in advance of its drive so that the points open sooner and the fuel mixture ignites earlier. As the engine speed slows down again, return springs return the plate to its original position. In an electronic ignition system, the contact breaker points are replaced by a transistor switch. This is triggered either by a magnetic sensor or by a photoelectric device and operates the coil in the normal way. Be careful with all ignition systems. The high voltage can give you a nasty shock. With electronic ignition systems, it can even be fatal. Routine maintenance of the ignition system starts with the spark plugs. These should be inspected and cleaned, and the plug gaps checked at each service interval. Pull off the high tension lead and use a plug spanner to unscrew the plug. Remove them one at a time to avoid mixing up the HT leads. If the engine is running properly, the end of each plug should be lightly coated with a pale brown deposit. A dry, black, sooty deposit indicates an over-rich fuel mixture. An overweak mixture causes the plugs to overheat, resulting in the electrodes having a glazed appearance with little or no deposit. If the electrodes are worn or the ceramic insulator is cracked, the plug will need to be renewed. Make sure that the sealing ring at the top of the thread is in good condition. Clean off any hard deposits with a wire brush. Lightly rub both electrode surfaces with a piece of emery board or a small file to expose bare metal. Using a feeler gauge, check that the gap is set correctly. The exact setting is usually given in the car's handbook and it's normally around 25 thousandths of an inch. The feeler blade should touch both electrodes but slide smoothly between them. Make sure that the metal screw cap is tight 
and refit the first plug and HT lead before removing the second. The electrodes gradually wear down with age and the plug should normally be replaced every 12,000 miles or so. Always fit high quality plugs made by a reputable manufacturer and make sure to use only those bearing the recommended code number for your engine, otherwise you may cause extensive damage. It's generally wiser to replace the whole set rather than changing just one or two on their own. Check the condition of the high voltage cables or HT leads connecting the distributor cap to the spark plugs and coil. If the insulation shows any signs of damage or cracking, the lead should be replaced. Most of these are simple push fit. Make sure that each cable is replaced by one of the same length. If the engine develops a misfire or turns over but refuses to start, first check that the plugs are sparking properly. You can do this by removing each plug in turn and reconnecting its HT lead. With a pair of insulated pliers, hold the plug against an unpainted metal part of the engine. Start the engine with a remote starter and look for a spark across the electrodes. If any one of the plugs fails to produce a spark, it may be either the lead itself, the coil or the distributor which is at fault. A faulty plug can be eliminated by connecting the HT lead to a flash tester and holding the other side firmly against an earth point. Start the engine again and gradually close the jaws of the tester. If a regular spark appears and the two indicator arrows are in the green part of the tester scale, then the plug is faulty. If no spark occurs, or it appears when the arrows are in the white or red sections, then there's a fault in either the distributor or the coil. All ignition coils are sealed units and can't be repaired, so if a fault occurs, you'll need to fit a replacement. Check whether your engine uses a ballast resistor and fit the appropriate coil. If your car has contact breaker points, the gap between the moving and fixed contacts is critical and should be checked at every service interval. Undo the retaining clips and lift off the distributor cap. With the rotor arm pulled off, turn the engine using a spanner on a pulley nut until the cam follower of the moving contact is resting on the very peak of one of the cam lobes. Measure the gap by inserting a feeler gauge. It should be the same size as your handbook recommends. If it needs altering, loosen off the adjusting screw securing the contacts to the base plate. Move the base plate until the gauge is a smooth light fit. Retighten the adjusting screw and recheck the gap. Lightly worn or corroded contact faces should be cleaned with a piece of emery paper. But if the surfaces are badly worn or pitted, the contact breaker should be replaced. Unclip the distributor cap and lift it off. Then pull off the rotor arm. Remove both the condenser and low tension leads by undoing the screw holding them onto the contact breakers. Most contacts are one piece units. Remove the securing screw and the adjusting screw if fitted and lift off the unit. Fit the new contacts in the reverse order, making sure that the condenser and low tension wires are firmly connected. And finally, recheck the gap and adjust it as necessary. On modern engines, setting the points gap is really only a basic adjustment. For greater accuracy and maximum engine performance, the dwell angle should be checked as well. This is the number of degrees through which the distributor shaft turns while the points are in the closed position. Most car manufacturers quote the angle as a range, in this case between 48 and 52 degrees. Using a test meter, the points must be set to give a dwell angle reading midway between these figures. Connect the meter according to the maker's instructions. 
start the engine and wait for the meter to stabilize. If the dwell angle shown is at the middle of the specified range, no further adjustment is needed. But if it's too small, you'll need to reduce the points gap. Or if it's too large, the gap needs to be increased. If the contact surfaces are excessively burnt, the condenser is likely to be faulty. Since its purpose is to prevent sparking across the points, you can check this by switching on the ignition and opening the points by hand. A strong flash indicates a fault and the condenser should be replaced. On most engines, they're fitted inside the distributor, although some are mounted on the outside of the body. To replace the unit, release the low tension wire from the terminal post. Undo the condenser securing screw and remove it from the distributor. Refit the new unit in the reverse order. Condenser faults are actually quite rare, but they're fairly cheap, so it's worth fitting a replacement if you're in any doubt. As we saw earlier, the spark at the plug needs to be timed to occur just before the piston reaches the top of its stroke, or top dead centre. This is known as the ignition timing, and to enable an exact setting to be made, every engine has fixed and moving timing marks. Usually, a single notch on the crankshaft pulley aligns with a series of fixed marks on the crank case. In some cars, there may only be one or perhaps two marks on the crank case, so check with your handbook to identify them. Ignition systems can be timed either statically, with the engine stopped, or dynamically while it's running. But in both cases, the dwell angle needs to be set first. To check the static timing, start by identifying the plug lead for number one cylinder. This is usually the one nearest the generator end of the engine. Then identify the top dead center mark on the crankcase. Turn the engine by hand until the pulley mark lines up with the top dead center mark. With the distributor cap removed, the rotor arm should point towards the cap contact and HT lead for number one cylinder. If it points in the opposite direction, rotate the pulley another full turn. Now connect the red wire of a test meter to the low tension terminal. Clip the black wire to an earth point and switch the meter to the voltage scale. Loosen the distributor clamp bolt just enough to rotate the body. And with the ignition on, Turn the distributor in the same direction as the rotation of the rotor arm until the meter needle swings back to zero. Turn the body back again very slowly until the needle just starts to move. Then re-tighten the clamp bolt. The ignition is now set so that the points are just opening as number one cylinder reaches top dead center. If you don't have a meter, a test lamp will do instead. But remember that only cars fitted with contact breaker ignition can be timed statically. Both contact and electronic ignition systems can be set far more accurately by using a stroboscope while the engine is running. Most strobes are connected in line between the spark plug and HT lead. To set the timing dynamically, start by checking the normal idling speed and ignition timing settings. These will be given in the car's handbook. Put a dab of white paint on the crankcase mark which corresponds to the correct timing angle. And a second dab on the pulley mark. This will help the marks to show up better. Connect a test meter and switch it to the tachometer scale. With the strobe connected, slacken the distributor clamp bolt as before. Start the engine and disconnect the vacuum advance pipe. Point the strobe at the timing marks and turn the distributor until you see the moving pulley mark line up with the fixed mark. Stop the engine and tighten the clamp bolt. Finally, after rechecking the setting, reconnect the vacuum advance pipe. A quicker and even more accurate setting can be made by using one of the new dial advance strobes. 
These have a built-in circuit which enables you to accurately set the timing from a single mark such as top dead center. By dialing the required timing angle into this circuit, the strobe automatically compensates for the right amount of advance. This unit uses an inductive pickup device which simply clips over the HT lead. Keep the distributor shaft well lubricated using a light oil and in damp weather spray a demoisturizing agent onto the distributor and coil, plug leads and battery terminals. This helps repel water from the system and prevent rust. To reduce wear and tear caused by friction, all metal moving parts inside the engine are lubricated by oil. It's held underneath the engine in the sump here, and it's forced around the whole system by a mechanical pump which is driven by the crankshaft. Most pumps can deliver oil under pressure at the rate of several gallons a minute. A relief valve controls the pressure inside the engine. From here, oil is passed through a filter to the main bearings and flows through feed holes or grooves along passageways in the crankshaft through to the big end bearings. Oil is thrown up by the rotating crankshaft and lubricates the gudgeon pins and cylinder walls. Scraper rings on the pistons remove any excess from the walls so that it falls back into the sump. Before we look at maintaining the engine lubrication system, you need to know a little bit about the oil itself. Because as well as reducing friction, the oil also absorbs many of the unwanted byproducts of the combustion process, corrosive acids and partially burnt material. And eventually the oil becomes so saturated with these products that it just looks like black sludge. And that is why it needs to be changed regularly. To maintain its efficiency, the oil needs to be thin enough to allow the moving parts to slide easily, but thick enough to keep the two surfaces separate. And it needs to be able to do that at different temperatures, both high and low. And the ability to do that is known as the oil's viscosity. And different parts of the car require oils of different viscosity. Engines use thinner oil than gearboxes and rear axles, so it's important to use the right one in each case. The viscosity of an oil is identified by its SAE number, which will be indicated on the container. Car manufacturers usually specify the type of oil recommended for their vehicles by quoting this number. You should find this information in the specification section of your car's handbook. Engine oil should be changed regularly, at least as often as the manufacturer recommends. The first step is to drain off the old oil. Run your engine until it's at a normal operating temperature. This makes the oil become thinner and flow more easily. Some sort of container is needed to collect the oil. An old tin with a hole cut in the side is ideal. First, remove the oil filler cap from the top of the engine. It's a good idea to remove the dipstick as well. This releases any partial vacuum which will slow down the draining process. From underneath the car, locate the drain plug on the sump. Using a suitable spanner, loosen it off until you can turn it with your fingers. Remember, the oil will be hot, so position the container carefully before you remove the plug completely. If your drainer plug is on the side of the sump instead of the bottom, don't forget that the oil will drain out at an angle at first. It'll take a little while for all of the old oil to trickle out. When this is finished, Clean any dirt or oil from the screw threads of both the plug and the plug hole. Replace the sump plug washer and retighten it using the spanner. Don't over tighten or you may strip the threads. The next step is to change the oil filter. Because of their shape, these can be difficult to remove. You can use a special filter wrench for this. Slide the chain loop over the filter and tighten it to take up the slack. Using the handle as a lever, unscrew the filter anti-clockwise and discard it. 
screw in the new filter until it's hand tight. Pour fresh oil slowly in through the filler neck on top of the engine. A funnel will help to avoid spillages. Most engines will take between 6 and 10 pints, so you'll need a one gallon tin or more. Pour in enough to register on the dipstick and then wait for a short time for all the oil to drain down into the engine. If you don't do this, there's a risk of overfilling the engine. After a while, top up to the correct level on the dipstick. Now run the engine for a short time, in case the level drops as the oil settles. Finally, check the sump bolt and filter for leaks. And make sure that the dipstick shows the correct level, somewhere between the maximum and minimum marks. Recheck the level regularly, once a week, and especially at the start of a long journey. A few engines are cooled by air, but most cars are water-cooled. A belt driven by the crankshaft pulley turns a cooling fan and water pump. The pump forces water around the cooling jacket and out to the radiator. Here it's cooled by both the revolving fan and the forward motion of the car. To operate efficiently, an engine must reach and maintain a certain temperature. This is governed by a thermostatically controlled valve situated between the pump and water jacket. If the valve is closed, water flows from the pump through the jacket and back again, but is prevented from circulating around the radiator. As the engine reaches its optimum running temperature, the thermostat opens to allow cool water to flow through the radiator. The correct temperature is maintained by the thermostat opening and closing when necessary. Most new cars are fitted with a plastic expansion tank. Check the water level every week using the mark on the side of the tank. Top up the system as necessary, but if the engine is hot, let it cool down first before loosening the filler cap. Wrap a cloth around the cap before you remove it. Some older cars don't have an expansion tank and are filled directly through the radiator cap. This regulates the pressure in the system and prevents the water boiling at a lower temperature. Examine the rubber seal regularly for damage or stretching. Watermarks around the radiator filler neck are a sure sign of a faulty cap. If necessary, replace it, making sure to fit one stamped with the correct pressure. Small leaks in the system can be cured by adding sealing fluid to the coolant. Check the condition of the fan belt for signs of cracking or splitting, and make sure that the tension is correct. You should be able to move it no more than half an inch midway along its longest run. You can find out how to adjust or replace the belt in the electrical part of the program. In cold weather, antifreeze should be added to the cooling system to prevent freezing. Most makes of antifreeze remain effective for about two years. After this, you should drain the system and refill with a fresh solution. Move the heater control to hot and remove the radiator pressure cap or expansion tank cap. Disconnect the bottom hose from the radiator and allow the coolant to drain out. When the system is completely empty, refit the hose and refill with cleaning fluid to clean out any dirt or chemical deposits. Follow the instructions on the container and run the engine for the specified length of time. At the end of this period, drain the system again, but remember that the fluid will be hot. With the drain plug or hose reconnected again, pour in the correct amount of antifreeze. This is usually 25% of the cooling system capacity, but in severe conditions, increase this to 33%, or a mixture of one part antifreeze to every two parts of water.
A faulty thermostat can cause the engine to either overheat or fail to reach its operating temperature. To test the unit, locate the thermostat housing, which is normally at the engine end of the top radiator hose. With the cooling system partially drained, undo the housing bolts and lift out the thermostat. The operating temperature will be stamped on the flange and you can check whether it's working correctly by immersing it in cold water. With the aid of a thermometer, heat the water until it reaches the operating temperature. The thermostat should be seen to open. When it's fully open, allow the water to drop below the operating temperature and the unit should close again. To refit, thoroughly clean any deposits from the flange seat and housing ceiling surfaces. This can be quite a laborious process, but you can save yourself a lot of effort and avoid damaging the surfaces by using gasket removing spray. This should remove any type of gasket by leaving it to soak for 10 to 12 minutes. Check that any replacement is marked with the correct temperature and position it in the housing so that it faces the right way round. Then smear gasket sealant onto the surface and fit a new gasket. Add more sealant to the top of the gasket and refit the housing top. Replace the bolts and tighten them evenly. Leave the compound to set for a while before refilling with coolant and testing for leaks. Check the condition of all petrol pipes and flexible hoses and make sure that all of the connections are secure. The air filter element should be renewed at the intervals specified in your handbook. Most of these air filters are of the paper type, though a few older cars can use an oil bath system. Undo any clips or screws holding the cover in place. Take out the element and discard it. Wipe clean the inside of the casing, but take care not to drop anything into the carburetor air intake. Fit the new element and replace the cover. The majority of cars are fitted with a mechanically driven fuel pump, although some use an electric pump fitted near to the petrol tank. Both types contain a filter which should be cleaned at recommended intervals. Mechanical pumps are always fitted to the engine and the filter can be reached without removing the whole unit. Undo the cover fixing screw and remove the filter cover. Lift out the filter and carefully wash it in clean petrol. Wipe any dirt from the rubber seal before reassembling the unit. To clean the filter in an electric pump, the whole pump needs to be removed from the car. Some modern pumps are sealed, in which case a separate filter is fitted in the petrol supply pipe from the tank. Many starting problems are caused by a fault somewhere in the fuel system. Assuming that there's enough petrol in the tank, start by checking the fuel pump. This can be done by disconnecting the inlet pipe to the carburetor and placing the end in a jar. Holding the jar and pipe in one hand, turn the engine over using a remote starter switch. If petrol flows strongly into the jar, the pump is operating correctly, which indicates a fault in the carburetor. If not, either the pump is faulty or the supply pipe from the tank is blocked. You can check the pump suction by using a vacuum tester connected to the inlet side. Turn the engine again using the remote switch and note the vacuum reading on the dial. If the reading is high enough, then the fuel pipe must be blocked. If it's too low, the pump is faulty and should be replaced. Start by disconnecting the inlet pipe and plugging the end to stop the fuel coming out. With the outlet pipe removed, undo the mounting nuts or bolts 
and withdraw the pump from the engine. Thoroughly clean the mounting area using gasket remover and recoat all sealing surfaces with a suitable gasket sealant. A non-hardening sealant is ideal for resisting fuel and oil. With a new gasket in place, insert the new pump, making sure that the operating lever fits over the camshaft. Replace the nuts or bolts and tighten them with your fingers. Push the pump towards the block until you can feel spring resistance between the lever arm and camshaft. If there's no resistance, the arm may have slipped under the cam. This can cause serious damage when you start the engine. Use a spanner to tighten the mountings. On electric pumps, check that the supply and earth connections are clean and that they make a tight fit with the pump terminals. Make sure that the other end of the earth wire is also clean and firmly connected to the car body. If the pump still doesn't work, you'll probably have to replace it. Disconnect all electrical connections and fuel pipes, remembering to block the inlet pipe. Undo the mountings and remove the pump. fit a new pump in the reverse order. If the fuel pump tests indicate a carburetor fault, remove the air filter assembly and inspect the carburetor for external fuel leakage. Spray the choke flap with carburetor cleaner to prevent sticking. Operate the throttle cable and make sure that all springs and linkages are kept well lubricated. If there's no obvious fault, the problem is likely to be inside the body of the unit, which will have to be dismantled. All carburetors operate on the Venturi principle. Each induction stroke sucks air through the air filter into the main barrel of the carburetor. At one point, known as the Venturi, the diameter of the barrel is reduced, causing the air to accelerate and produce a slight vacuum. Fuel from the petrol pump enters a separate chamber containing a float. As the level rises, the float lifts and operates a valve to control the fuel flow. The float chamber is connected by a series of passageways and jets to the venturi. Fuel is sucked into the venturi and mixed with the airflow. A pivoting disc or throttle valve situated inside the barrel is operated by the accelerator cable and controls the flow of air-fuel mixture and hence the speed of the engine. Some engines are fitted with a fixed jet carburetor which has several jets to vary the fuel supply for all operating conditions. Others use a variable jet carburetor with only one single jet which can be altered in size to cope with the constantly changing fuel demand. This is a greatly oversimplified explanation and carburetor designs vary widely in detail. So before attempting any internal repairs or servicing, it's advisable to obtain precise information on the particular model fitted to your car. In many cases, if a fault exists, it may be less troublesome and can even be cheaper to have the whole unit replaced. But there are external adjustments which should be made as part of regular maintenance. The idling speed and mixture settings, both of which affect the smooth running of the engine. To reduce exhaust pollution, modern carburetors are designed to produce very low levels of carbon monoxide emission, and so they should be adjusted using an exhaust gas meter. This measures the amount of carbon monoxide as a percentage of the total gas emitted. All vehicle manufacturers now quote tolerance limits for CO content and this can be used to achieve the most efficient carburetor settings. With the engine fully warmed up, connect the unit according to the maker's instructions, using either the car's own battery or use a separate 12 volt battery. You'll also need a tachometer to measure the engine revolutions. Connect a multimeter 
and turn the range selector switch to the tachometer position. Tolerances and methods of adjustment vary, but on this car, a fixed jet carburetor is fitted and the basic idling speed should be approximately 800 RPM, while the CO content should be 1.5%. The idling speed is set by adjusting the mixture bypass screw. The CO content is then set correctly by turning the mixture adjusting screw. You'll need to check that the mixture is set correctly. An over-rich or over-weak setting can cause serious engine damage as well as poor petrol consumption and performance. As we've seen, the condition of the plugs will give a rough indication of this, but a much more accurate assessment can be made by using the colour tune system. This enables you to see inside the cylinders while the engine is running. Different petrol air ratios burn with different colours, so if the mixture is set incorrectly, you can readjust it until you see the right colour. Yellow indicates an over-rich mixture. A whitish-blue colour indicates too little petrol. And Bunsen blue means that the mixture is correct. Adjusting the mixture on engines fitted with twin carburetors is more complicated. Each unit should feed exactly the same amount of fuel and air to the engine and you can only adjust this accurately by using a carburetor balancing system. In cars fitted with fuel injection, the carburetor is replaced by a complex pressurised system. These are usually electronically controlled and spray precisely the right amount of fuel directly into the inlet manifold so that it is in correct proportion to the airflow. Professional training is required for these systems and you should have all maintenance carried out by a specialist. Over a period of time, dirt or carbon deposits may build up in the injection system causing all kinds of problems. An injector cleaner added to the petrol tank every so often may well provide the remedy for poor performance or difficult starting. The last part in the fuel burning process is the exhaust and most systems will need replacing at least once during the car's lifetime. Small holes or leaks can be repaired temporarily but corrosion usually starts from the inside so by the time you can spot the problem from outside the system may already be beyond repair. A faulty exhaust can be illegal as well as being the cause of poor performance and higher petrol consumption so it's a false economy not to change the system. Removal can be both tricky and time-consuming unless you're experienced so leave it to the experts. You won't save money by doing it yourself. As we've seen, the valves are opened and closed by the rocker assembly, which is driven by the camshaft. To allow for expansion, there must be a certain amount of clearance in the valve gear. The correct valve, or tappet clearance, is vital to the performance of the engine. Some modern engines are now being fitted with self-adjusting hydraulic tappets, which require no maintenance. But on many others, the tappet clearance should be checked and adjusted at the recommended service intervals. Start by removing the bolts securing the rocker cover to the cylinder head. Lift off the cover and sealing gasket. The tappets must be adjusted in the correct sequence, usually with the engine at operating temperature. Check your service manual and make a note of the sequence as well as the clearances for both inlet and exhaust valves. Each clearance must be checked with the valve in the fully closed position. Identify the first valve in the sequence and turn the engine by rotating the crankshaft pulley until the spring end of the corresponding rocker arm reaches its highest point. Insert the correct sized feeler gauge it should slide smoothly under moderate pressure. If it's too tight or too loose, the clearance needs adjusting. 
Clearances on overhead valve engines are usually adjusted by releasing the lock nut and turning the adjusting screw whilst holding a feeler gauge at the same time. Easier and more accurate adjustments can be made using a micrometer tappet adjuster which replaces the feeler gauge altogether. On an overhead cam engine with rocker arms, the valve clearance is measured between the cam lobes and the arms themselves. In this case, adjustment is made by releasing the lock nut and turning a fixed stud to achieve the right clearance. Continue the process until you've finished the sequence. Clean the gasket sealing surface thoroughly. Always fit a new rocker gasket and coat both sides with a suitable sealant. Position the gasket to the cover and lower it onto the head. Finally, re-tighten the bolts evenly, working on alternative sides, but don't over-tighten them. In a direct overhead cam engine, shims are used to adjust the clearance between the cam and the tappet face. Specialist equipment is needed to do this and you should leave the job to a professional. If your engine suffers from a noticeable loss of performance, a compression gauge will help to diagnose the problem. With the engine at normal operating temperature, remove all of the spark plugs. Screw the end of the gauge pipe into one of the spark plug sockets. Open the throttle and turn the engine over on the starter. Make a note as soon as a steady reading is obtained. Then repeat the process for each cylinder in turn. The readings for all cylinders should be within about 10 pounds per square inch of each other. A lower reading on one or more cylinders indicates damage or wear in the pistons, piston rings or cylinders, or poor valve seating or worn valve guides. A much higher reading indicates a fault in the piston rings or cylinder bore area rather than the valves. If two adjacent cylinders give almost identical low readings on both tests, then the problem is likely to be a blown cylinder head gasket. If you'd like advice or more information on any of the items shown in this program, phone the relevant number and ask for technical inquiries.